Welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. We are delighted to have the AIA LA Professional Practice Committee here present to us um, one of their monthly meetings. And if you're not presently involved with the Practice Committee, please reach out to me or Jessica or, or John V or Naoko and we'll get you uh, integrated into all the programs that they do. Um, it's really a great group of people. Um, I want to thank Lucas Reams, AIA, for bringing this uh, conversation to us tonight. And with that, I'll introduce everyone to Lucas. Thank you. Oh, by the way, if you're not speaking, please keep yourself on mute. And we'll be doing Q&A uh, towards the middle of the program. Great. Thanks, Will. Um, welcome, everybody. I think we're excited to uh, have everyone today, uh, particularly with all the things going on, on in the world and, and you choosing to spend your time here with us. As Will mentioned, our panel is hosted by the AIA Los Angeles Practice Committee. I'm Lucas Reams, Director at Trimble Consulting. Uh, this audience may know me more, more through the Gary Technologies relationship that were acquired by Trimble. A few years back, I'll be your moderator. I'm joined by John V. Kanani with IBI, who will be helping field questions uh, at the end of the session. So just a few logistics, just to review, as Will mentioned, uh, the session will be recorded. Uh, if you're in the audience, uh, please mute your mic if it's on. Um, with a QA and a at the end of the session, uh, if, you, if you want to, go ahead and type your questions if you have them for the panelists or, or in general throughout the session. John V is going to be keeping track of that and try to consolidate uh, so that we can bubble up the, the questions to the top there. And with that, we'll sort of jump into our topic. Uh, our, our topic today is on the current trends in digital assets for owners. Um, if we look back, you know, 20 years ago in the industry, architects and contractors were generally the originators of bringing 3D models to the table for the closeout of projects um, and to help deliver the projects. Um, over time, though, facility owners have been finding additional value in these digital deliverables and have been requiring and collecting them for a variety of purposes. Um, flash forward to just last month where NIBS announced the beginnings of a national BIM program, which will focus on a more comprehensive look at what's needed to provide owners a complete package to manage their assets. Um, that's pretty big news. Like, like we're talking about um, comparing to other uh, national programs that are out there in the UK and Singapore and others. Um, so in today's discussion, uh, we're gonna be defining digital assets very broadly, allowing our panelists to give their unique perspectives on how they leverage digital assets in their facilities and how they uh, deliver and operate their projects. So uh, turning to our panel, uh, we have uh, Terry Mestas, Senior Director of Design and Construction at Caltech. Uh, we have Brian Pratt, uh, Campus Architect, Associate Vice Chancellor at UC Irvine. Laura Shin, Director of Facilities Planning at San Diego State University. Ifani Zewi, Senior VDC Manager at Clark Construction. And Azam Khan, Co-Founder and CEO at Trax, GD, and 2021-060 participant. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to give everybody in the panel a chance, a uh, few minutes here to introduce themselves a little bit in more detail and go through on how they use digital assets in their current uh, facilities and in their current projects. So uh, with, uh, Terry, I think we're gonna go ahead and start with you and then we'll go in order of how I introduced everybody today. Okay, great. Good evening, everyone. Um, so a little bit about um, the, my group. Um, we do all of the planning, design and construction for Caltech, regardless of the project mm -hmm. size. Um, this can range from really small projects, uh, office renovation for $20,000 to very large capital projects. Uh, we recently completed a neurology research building with a budget of over 200 million, and we're just starting a new project um, for sustainability research that has a budget over, of over 225. Um, but our bread and butter work is um, renovation for research laboratories. Uh, we have a pretty uh, large portfolio of that every year. And um, in addition to that, there's a, there's a large array. It's about 50 projects a year or more that we do. And I think the key here, and as it relates to digital assets, is that we have a small team. Uh, it's about 15 people that are executing a really large volume of work. So on digital tools, I thought I would mention a few of our challenges and then some of the goals that we have. Um, one of the largest challenges we have is, um, is getting things through our security. So uh, some of you on the phone uh, might know what a HECBAT form is, um, but um, really understanding what tools are out there um, that can work for academic institutions um, and can go through that stringent security process is really key. Um, 
And, uh, and also we have purchased an array of digital um, assets over time. And it really fed, fed um, or addressed the need at that time. And I think as a result, now we have a lot of disparate tools that don't talk to one another. So we are just starting to develop our digital roadmap um, and uh, having um, some expertise to, to know again, what, what's gonna meet the security standards, but how we can also leverage what we have is gonna be really key. Um, the other thing that we've run into, especially as we're working more remotely, is uh, we do have some tools that have been managed by outside vendors. Um, that's been great from an output standpoint, but um, it hasn't really allowed us the full flexibility to allow other vendors to get into the tool, update the data, or manipulate the data. So just having ultimate flexibility going forward is key for us. So um, a few things that, um, that we're working on and our focuses are, are tools that um, are gonna provide the maximum amount of communication and collaboration. Um, like many of my colleagues here on the phone, you know, there's a number of stakeholders that we need to work with. So presenting the data, but also allowing for some automated workflows that can allow for decision-making is key. Um, and also uh, tools that are flexible and easy to implement. Um, you know, sometimes organizations get fixated on the tools that they have and, and changing from those is difficult. So I think um, easy to use, uh, flexible, and something that is scalable to the array of projects that we have. And lastly, I'll say that, um, that of course, we need um, tools that are gonna help us manage our data and our, our projects. Um, but I'm particularly interested in, in tools that we can generate, you know, ROM costs, maybe total cost of ownership type of analysis, um, tools that can help ease a project closeout, you know, handoff of the project to the owner, um, you know, team-wide risk management, um, things like that that I think we can really um, leverage across all the facilities, just not um, design and construction. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Terry. And with that, uh, we'll go ahead and go over to Brian. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Brian Pratt. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Design and Construction Services and the Campus Architect at the University of California, Irvine. Um, I'm a licensed architect and have worked for UCI for about seven years. And prior to joining UCI, I was working in private practice on a lot of higher ed work, as well as sports, entertainment, justice, and federal work. At UCI, uh, similar to Terry, my group is responsible for delivering large scale capital projects. And we typically deliver our project design build. Um, we're currently working on over $2 billion worth of projects awarded or in construction. That doesn't include the projects in planning, which, of which there are many. Um, so when it comes to digital assets for UCI, you know, we ask for a variety of deliverables um, you know, at, at the typical milestones. Um, and we ask for live Reddit, Revit files or uh, to simple scans of submittals and most formats in between. Um, similar to Terry, you know, we, we struggle with tools to use to mine that data um, for long-term maintenance of our facilities, but the goal is timely operations and maintenance of systems um, such as change out of, of filters or smooth renovations of our facility. And so for drawings at close out of projects, we ask for an LOD of 500. While at CDE level, we ask for an LOD of 400. Um, the data come in many forms beyond drawings and there's an incredible volume. Um, unfortunately, we aren't as sophisticated as we would like to be uh, in terms of state of the art use of the data we ask for, um, but we like to think we'll use it someday. <laughs> uh, we ask for the data because our buildings are long, very long-term investments and are renovated over time as needs shift. And knowing the details, location, sizes, models, capacities, and the installed conditions, condition is a huge benefit to the campus. And we hope our ability to use the data will expand quickly. And, and even going backwards, it will be important to have the rich data available to us. Um, and it's such a long-term valuable resource. Um, I do think it's interesting that the design build process, I think works well for us in this regard because there's a strong check and balance of installed as built conditions in the field and what is captured in those uh, electronic submittals. And we find there's a close connection among the designer, the builder and our in-house inspection team that ensures the accur accuracy of the deliverables as well as the quality. Um, but like Terry pointed out, you know, we still struggle with the disparate tools that 
aren't really good at talking to one another. And that's a real challenge for us. But uh, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Great. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Laura, we'll hand it over to you. Uh, thanks. Um, I, I'm sort of on the other end in that I'm one of those really um, key users of the data that a lot of you probably think, gosh, why are they making me turn all this stuff in at closeout? Um, I'm the director of planning at San Diego State University. My responsibilities are capital planning, space planning, master planning, um, all of the environmental work, and a lot of the kind of front end, uh, what you might call scoping and programming for projects. And so for me, it's really important to understand what do we have? So if somebody comes and says, okay, I need a new building or I need new space, I need more space, I need to understand what do they actually have? So we have a database that is a homegrown database for this, the CSU. I actually think it was initially done by someone that worked at the UC system and then went out on their own and created a company and they've created it for and made it available to all three campuses, which the, the central system funded for us. But we are probably one of the more robust users among the CSUs of that database. So we require uh, archival record drawings and, and those are really important because uh, things change fast. And even a newer building, we often will go back within a year or two because there's different occupants that need to have different needs. And so being able to go back and get that, the drawings and understanding what was put in and how many fume hoods are, can this building handle or what is the electrical capacity in case somebody needs some sort of specialty, you know, high voltage or high amperage plug or something, you know, some piece of equipment. So all of that is super, super important. But I think when I put another hat on and I look even farther into the future, and this is my sort of space planning and, and capital planning role, I, we are moving in our campus. There's a movement that I've been wanting to see, and I'm finally seeing it now, towards a much more rigorous management of our space, realizing it is a resource and it is a finite resource. And there should be an equitable and transparent means to distribute that space. And the space shouldn't just be given to people uh, without some thought as to what it's capable of doing. And all of that translates back to really knowing our buildings. And one of the best ways to know our buildings is to have good data. And so we need to understand the spaces that are in there. We need to understand who's assigned to the spaces. Like Terry, I'm very frustrated that we have all these different, we have all this great data and different databases, but connecting them is sometimes really, really difficult. We're lucky that we have a feed directly from our course schedule. So we can look fairly quickly at how well utilized or not our classrooms are in our teaching labs, that's great. But I would love to have a similar feed from our research foundation so I knew what the heck research is going on in what space and who's in there. I would like to know who has two or three offices. <laughs> I'm sure there's some people that don't want me to know that, but you know, I think all of that is really, really important as we move forward and look at a, a situation where I don't think we can afford, nor is it particularly sustainable to just build a new building every time we have a need. You know, we don't have the money to do that, but if we really understand our buildings, we know what they're capable of and we know what space is available, that would be, you know, really useful in, in making better use of what we have before we go thinking about building new. So it's also highly um, supportive of our sustainability efforts. Um, and thank you very much for having me. Well, thank you, Laura. Uh, if on you. Hi. Yeah, so I'm Ifani Zewi. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, I initially started my education in architecture um, and then I segue into um, uh, an engineering firm that did all of um, plumbing, electrical, mechanical. Um, and now I am the senior manager for virtual design and construction at uh, Clark Construction. So I feel like I have come full circle in the AC industry uh, in a short while. Um, but <clears throat> at Clark, and we are big GC within the United States. Uh, we have a heavy presence um, on the East Coast where we do a lot of government work. Um, and on the West Coast here, we have a lot of diverse portfolio of stuff that we do. Um, my role really has been to help integrate technology and make Clark, at least put Clark in the forefront of all the changes um, in technology and, and, and help us be a better builder. And in terms of digital assets and are deliverables to the owners. A lot of times what we do is we have to take a, um, a integral role in 
trying to figure out exactly what the owner might need, regardless of what they have told us that they need. Um, sometimes we have projects where, you know, maybe it's a TI, I don't know, <clears throat> materials, all the interior spaces are going to be gutted. Well, if you're going to be adding some kind of, you know, tile top into the slab, well, maybe we need to do a scan to check for deviations because maybe the type of topping and you know, tile you're, you're looking for might not work with the current deviations you have on the slab. And we can do an entire you know, building scan, turn that over to our clients and let them know this is exactly what you have for your building as it is. Um, so they're able to make decisions in real time and say, okay, well, you know, maybe exactly what we wanted to do might not work. Maybe we need some concrete fill to make that topping work. Um, we had a situation where oh, we had in a, a really old building uh, it was in San Francisco, I think it was initially built in like 1921. It was a really old power station that was going to be repurposed. Um, but since it was a historic building, they were trying to, of course, preserve as much of it as possible. Well, the drawings were, of course, very old and not very reliable. Uh, the architects had put together um, their model and their drawings. Well, we went in there and did a full laser scan of the building. And we realized, well, the building as it is now is not 100% rectilinear anymore. Um, they had a couple of bows inwards. So what the architect had planned in their model would not have fit. So all the HVAC, a lot of other things would not have fit in the current building as it was. Now, this was not a deliverable <clears throat> that we were asked for. But we took a look at that situation and figured, you know, this might be a good thing to do to understand what those challenges might be for us. So then we don't have any issues that come up as we get into construction where things like this might become a problem. And that was really big for us to call that earlier on. Um, but I think more of what we are seeing today more than just doing laser scans and as build captures is um, you know we've got a lot of clients that are asking for um, record models at turned over um, at project completion and we have clients that are very detailed about what they want they have their own facility maintenance group that are looking for specific asset tags you know, for all major equipment so that you know when we turn this over and you know maybe it's two o'clock in the morning and they've got a fan that isn't working or a chiller that's not working or whatever, they could pull up that model and run through it and figure out exactly what chiller that was. You know, is it redundant? Is it a redundant chiller? Or you know, how to take it offline, how to chase that down, and so on and so forth. So, you know, we're being able to harness technology, make sure that we get everyone on the same page, all our subcontractors, and make sure that they know what to deliver it. And you know, you had mentioned earlier about having models at level 500. Um, we get a little bit of resistance on that, but it's good to let them know early exactly what is needed. So we turn those over with all the information that makes it a BIM model. Uh, without that eye in the BIM, then it's just not smart. So make sure that all the models have the integrated information in there so that you click on a fan call unit and it tells you exactly what it is and you know what you're doing with it. So um, it's kind of varied what we've been able to deliver. Uh, we delivered 40 models that showed detail in you know, construction sequencing. We've done that for um, the LA County Museum just for their marketing. Um, but I think the biggest part of it has been being able to turn over those smart models at the end of the project um, to enable uh, clients continue to mine that data and use it down the line, as you mentioned, Laura, for a lot of information to continue to keep their models smart, regardless of the tenants that they have you know, in each of the spaces. Great. Thanks for that, Fanny. Uh, Azam? Thanks, uh, Lucas. Thanks for the invite as well. Uh, I'm Azam Khan. I'm the CEO and uh, co-founder of Tracks GD. We develop uh, innovative mapping tools for business processes covering the complete life cycle of uh, large scale buildings and infrastructure. Uh, we, um, uh, we basically make massive projects manageable by creating visual roadmaps to, um, to help show the big picture and uh, to, to uh, help communicate with uh, a variety of stakeholders. Um, our, our, we're currently working with Stantec, for example, on a $1.2 billion hospital project. And these are very complex projects, uh, as you know, with uh, all kinds of uh, uh, 
uh, sub objectives and objectives and deliverables and so on. So having uh, that process, which is an eight year process mapped out visually helps keep everybody uh, on the same page and prevents delays and so on. Um, for these, for us, these, these roadmaps themselves are digital assets, um, but they also uh, act as an organizing framework to layer in all of the other assets that are created throughout the process. So you can search and quickly find anything throughout the project and things like that. Um, the, um, uh, for digital assets, I mean, when we're working with uh, campuses, um, we'll, we'll take whatever we can get you know, they're, they're often of different ages and uh, different uh, levels of quality. And it helps if you know where they came from, if it came from, you know, uh, it, there's a big difference between it coming from a student project or from, uh, from the original architects and so on. Um, the, uh, once we have whatever we can get, uh, we, we add, uh, go through the process of adding a layer of uh, metadata. And this is so that we can connect things um, uh, to help support automated analysis. So we, we want to know, uh, you know, all the details. Uh, for for example, if if there's a lead application, we want to we want to see the actual application to know what points were pursued, which ones were awarded, which ones were not awarded, and why. Uh, if there's some GIS map data, we want to add the metadata for where the transit stops are, or uh, pathways, or roadways, and so on, uh, so that we can help automate calculation of some of these points and other purposes, occupancy simulation. And for example, in a building information model, we have scripts to help go through the, th the whole thing and uh, assign uh, sensors uh, from the sensor database, from the building automation system to the physical assets in the, in the digital asset in the BIM. Um, an automated analysis could be something like a lead certification process that we want to automate as much as possible. We also want to make um, uh, a recommender system, we want to be able to recommend a list of uh, the top uh, retrofit um, projects that could be implemented to both reduce uh, the total cost of ownership while increasing the sustainability of the campus. Uh, in terms of um, uh, the value of, uh, of digital assets, I think as, as some of the other speakers have already said, the, the, if, if they can speed up the process, um, you know, there's, there's increasing pressure to, I think, have the built environment perform better in general, uh, especially at the portfolio scale. Uh, so we have uh, customers who have a large portfolio who want to have, um, you know, bigger impact across the whole portfolio. And so if it'd be great if something uh, in, in creating a digital process or a digital asset within that process could speed things up by an order of magnitude. So something that might take 10 days would take one day or 10 hours might take one hour. So that's the kind of um, uh, scale that we hope will, will make a difference. And um, it's unlikely that anything else than uh, further digitization could get us, get us there. Great, thanks, Azam. And, and from you representing sort of the, the technologist perspective, you know, you're bringing to light the, the idea or the, the, I guess the, the known issue that there's a lot of different data sources for all of the information coming in, right? We're talking about models, we're talking about scans, we're talking about plans, drawings, uh, even photographs, whatever it may be. And you're on the consuming side of saying, working with, let's say, a, you know, with, a, with a campus saying, okay, well, what do you have so that I can help you build this digital, uh, you know, this digital sort of symbolic model to help with all the decision making and all the different topics that you just covered. But the reality is, is that you then have to scrub that information and you're, you're sort of on the receiving end of, of, of what's available. So I guess yeah. that kind of, you know, that, that leads maybe into the, the first uh, uh, topic that we wanted to really bring up for the discussion here is, um, you know, just around how we can better define as a group, because I think everybody here on the panel uh, all of you represent a different perspective within the industry. Um, and, and I guess just to note to the audience, I think most all have architecture backgrounds. So even though we don't have a, a firm represented, I think if, if one of you also wants to speak from your past life, that's fine as well. Um, but just how can we, as an as a industry, better define what is important to who? Um, and, and, and when should we start looking to acquire it? Like, so, so for example, um, a donor, you know, what's important for a donor that's helping fund a project may be different 
or in conflict with even what's necessary for maintenance teams or facilities engineers or or what's important for an architect to resolve a design or or a contractor to find and source products and um, so uh, maybe Terry maybe you could start and kick this one off because I think you're the one here that uh, rep started to reference you know you and Caltech going down uh, and, and starting to build you know a long-term vision and roadmap for what your sort of digital delivery strategy is and and so how I guess the I guess the question would be while you're going through and building that roadmap and looking through uh, how, you know where you want to go and how you're going to get there what is the process to identify and engage stakeholders and uh, not necessarily to have one you know the, the loudest person or group in the room so to speak get all the attention but you know what I guess what is a good process to help build that that strategy and, and how do you engage all of the different stakeholders and take into account all the different topics and in, involved in a, in a digital delivery strategy? Sure. Yeah. No, uh, we have a lot of projects with a lot of different stakeholders to include donors, which have a, a very large role in our projects. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, the basis of how to go about figuring out what's important to everybody is, is, is conversation. Um, you know, Caltech is a small institute, so a lot of, lot of meetings. Um, and uh, I think Laura said it, but um, the, the, the most important thing for us is having the data and having a, a high level of confidence of the data to be able to make the right decisions. So that, that's going to be a, a guiding marker for, um, for our roadmap. Um, you know, we do have a working group group that goes over, um, you know, our digital assets and what we want and, and what we have and how to keep leveraging what we have. Um, I, I think what we're what we're missing is um, the knowledge of, of the array of tools that is out there and uh, also also somebody to help us ask the right questions um, at Caltech. Our IT department is separate from facilities and design and construction. So having a subject matter expert uh, in, in the room or in the conversation to help um, guide some of these conversations, I think is, is key and something that um, frankly, we, we don't have right now. Um, we, we have started to put together some tools to, to help gather what's important. Um, one of those is, is an OPR, um, owner's project requirements. You know, back in the day when I did these in my design life, you know, it was very manual, it was in Word and, you know, we'd go into a meeting and we'd turn out a bunch of data and we'd all go back to our desks and start typing. Um, we are attempting to automate that um, to make it um, easier. It's something that um, goes across the entire institute, so it's very collaborative. Um, but that's kind of the, the first steps um, that we take to, uh, to help define what's important um, and hoping to continue to improve that. Okay, and then Brian, I, you know, I, I saw you getting ready to talk, I was just about to ask, because you have, you know, you have a, a, a a large uh, program that's being delivered right now. And a lot of times we see uh, these types of, of long-term strategies help like taking a, you know, a, a new program that's being implemented and using that as a mechanism, as a vehicle to start to uh, test some, some hypotheses out to get some, you know, to get things going and to start building that, that future. Um, is that something that you're seeing with, with uh, possibilities with your current, current program that you're helping deliver? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Lucas. Um, I think part of what we struggle with, though, is um, how do we keep the data fresh as buildings evolve over time? And maybe our campus expertise isn't as strong as the expertise of the original delivery. Um, say, say it's a Revit model or something like that. And, and so we get this really robust, really fleshed out um, BIM model. And then it's only as good as the next person that digs into it and messes it all up, um, you know. And then the other thing I would add, you know, is that we often don't know we need the data until somebody asks for it. And then we're going back and trying to, to sort of recover the data. Um, so, you know, we try, we're trying to get ahead of that. And like Terry was outlining, you know, different tools to get ahead of that. Um, bring the stakeholders in earlier, um, work with our um, partners in the industry. You know, our partners in the industry like Ifanye are, are um, more knowledgeable than we are about cutting edge and leading edge tools that may, will make our lives much easier. But, um, you know, where we struggle is 
you know, all of a sudden somebody sa say it's a donor says, oh, I need a piece of information about this building we built, you know, three years ago. And we go, gosh, you know, um, go find that, you know, dig it up or try to recreate it based on the data that we have. So, and that could be as simple as, you know, the most current rendering, you know, often a rendering is done early in the project. The project evolves at, at closeout and, you know, the rendering doesn't depict the final final building. And, and, and uh, so, you know, keeping that data fresh is something that's really important to us. And so we got to be smart about going forward and bringing all these tools together. And it, it's almost, you know, as dumb as a checklist, you know, as soon as somebody asks for it, it goes on the checklist of what we need to ask for on every project. Um, and, and going forward, trying to manage that enormous amount of data that we're asking for. And, you know, having been on the architect side, I totally get it. You know, I'm one of those owners that you, you all look at and say, why the hell do they need all this information? Why, you know, what are they going to do with all this? And a big part of it is, is, is trying to figure out down the road when somebody asks for it, at least having it available and having it there rather than having to recreate it is, is a big challenge for us. I was going to say one of the things that I try to do when people, because we often have a lot of requests for, oh, we have this data that is related to buildings or related to rooms or related to systems, and we'd like to keep it in your FIS system. And I, I try to ask, okay, whose data is it? Who's going to own it? Who's going to collect it? And who's going to be responsible for its accuracy? And if you can't answer those questions, then as much as you might want to feed it into the database, you, you know, it's going to be a one time, it's good for 30 seconds, and then you're done. <laughs> so I think that's one thing that's really helpful is, is really kind of, you know, people have a lot of great ideas about what should be in the database. So as much as we can have that other, that data owned by others, and then feed into or connect to, um, so that if there's a problem, we can say, okay, this is not our data, let's go find out why this isn't working. Or, you know, it's easy, it's easy for programmers to fix a broken link. But it's not easy for somebody to go out and make sure that all of the, the buildings are still assigned to the people they're assigned to, or the mechanical systems haven't been updated. Or, and I think there's also a, a question: a lot of the information that's in a BIM model, for example, it would be useful to the folks that are that are maintaining the building, but whether they have the ability to go in and extract that data and use it is is another question. And so it's a question of, do we train, you know, is that part of the training uh, or is there a simpler tool that requires less training? Uh, right now, our folks are struggling just to keep stuff fixed, let alone take time to learn these other tools. So another question I think we really do have to ask is, you know, do we have the bandwidth to support this and keep it fresh? Um, so I, you know, if I wish we had a, a rigorous program like Terry has, it sounds like she's kind of got everybody together and trying to figure out what is the path forward with data. But if we ever get there, I think we're going to have to ask ourselves a lot of really hard questions about, or, or are we willing to pay to outsource this for somebody that, you know, then sort of becomes joined at the hip because that company is the one that knows everything about what we have. So um, those are all really important. As much as I would love to have every piece of data feeding in I don't want to maintain all of it. So if someone can't step forward and say, I'll maintain it, then I'm going to think twice about whether I really need it. So I think those are other important questions to ask. Yeah, I mean, just in, in terms of roles, right? On, on a project, you would typically rely on a BIM manager or somebody along that lines that, that is really the heartbeat of information exchange, right? And managing models and data sets. But that's that's just for the duration of the delivery phase, right? So. Are, are, are any of you seeing uh, sort of an ev evolution of a, a needed skill sets uh, across the boards? Um, I mean, Laura, what you're, you're pointing out is it would be great to have somebody that would identify to be hold to hold that role and to be able to have that responsibility for managing that data set over time. Um, but sometimes, you know, with with how uh, organizations are structured, different divisions, etc. You know, we, we start seeing more introductions of like data analysts, not just to maintain the information, but to, you know, analyze it and, and come up with uh, uh, information that could be used, you know, facilitate planning, et cetera. Um, so, I mean, do you, I guess the question would be to anybody that wants to take it, do you see an evolution of roles and evolving skill sets that are needed to, 
to just engage um, engage with information. Yeah, I'll I'll take that if that's okay. Um, so to step back a little bit, I think a lot of what we've done is when we've been asked um, for a record model, we sit with the you know the client and their group. Uh, a lot of times, it's the facilities managing group to understand exactly what data it is that they need. Um, a lot of times there's data in the model that you don't need. Um, when you ask for a LOD 500 model, you may not need everything in the LOD 500 model. Matter of fact, you don't want to get everything in the LOD 500 model because then it becomes really heavy. You might get um, chillers that have everything in it, you know, down to washers and, you know, it'll take you an inordinate amount of time just to open that model. So a lot of what we do is just, you know, make sure that everybody understands um, what is important. Uh, we have proprietary scripts that we can run sometimes to help generate that information that you need. So you have exactly what you need without any of the fluff and without the weight of the model being something that becomes, you know, you need a supercomputer just to be able to open it. Um, <clears throat> then taking a step back, We've tried a lot to put the data in different formats that make it able to or make the uh, um, owners able to open them and run them easily. A lot of times we will deliver a federated Navisworks model as an NWD as well as a Revit model. Uh, the Navisworks model is a lot easier to navigate through. They still contain all the data from the Revit models. Um, so when you click on any piece of equipment, it tells exactly where it is and what it is. Um, but I think that the, the key thing is to have within the organization someone that is responsible for coalescing that data and maintain, maintaining it. Um, there was a project we were working on in the hospital and we got, I got a model that was a Revit uh, 2011 model and it, it took me forever just to upgrade it to Revit 2020 and just open And I think I have a pretty fast computer. Um, so things like that, is, you know, you would need someone on that end that's able to continue, rather than just the data being put in there and then it's done and it's on a hard drive somewhere, right? <clears throat> Being able to actually look through it, maintain it. If a piece of equipment's changed, well, no doubt equipment's been changed, right? If you're no longer, you know, maybe you now have a train chiller instead, right? Then we'll have that, information updated, make sure that the model is in a version that is usable um, rather than it just again being pushed aside and no one being able to use it when you, that um, scenario actually comes up and you need to get into the model. And then it's like, oh, well, we have all this stuff from you know 12 years ago, but no one can actually access it. So I, I think that would be key to having someone on that end that is you know in charge of all that information. Yeah, I would just add too. Um, you know, I think the data, while robust, is fairly fragile. You know, if we do a renovation and go in and um, have another architect or or even our on staff folks try to try to incorporate, say, a separate BIM model into uh, for for a couple rooms in an overall building BIM model. Um, or, then, you know, there's a lot of introduction of a lot of error there um, that can corrupt the data in a way that makes it not really usable for its intended purpose when it's fresh out of the gates as an as-built from a, you know, from a brand new building. Um, so, you know, in terms of your question, Lucas, about skill sets, I mean, we're seeing, you know, an elevation of everybody uh, you know requirements of everybody's digital sort of intelligence and ability to use um you know really incredible amounts of data but but i think we're still you know behind the curve um you know once again i think industry is is ahead of us um and we have a lot to learn from industry about um the skill sets that that we can outsource versus those skill sets that we need in-house and what if on you just outlined sitting down with an owner and running through you know the data that is useful and important um sort of step by step i think is a valuable idea and i think forums like like this are a good way to do that and obviously i think just through collaboration on projects is is, is another way i'm um, just uh, also just by hearing everybody talk here uh as as technology you know continues to uh, to develop and evolve. Uh, also, our vocabulary around how we speak around the technology likely has to 
to continue to evolve. And uh, whereas, you know, as we mentioned, we started the, the session off talking about what things were like uh, 20 years ago and it was, you know, the 3D model. And uh, now there's, uh, when we talk about digital assets, there's, there's uh, a variety of models, uh, everything from, like we said, um, even scanning of as-built systems and, and different things like that. And then, and how you collect and maintain that data over time. Um, one thing that I thought um, interesting, uh, Awesome, what, what you were really starting to hone in on from, from your perspective of, you know, the def how we're talking about models. I mean, uh, uh, you represent uh, uh, through tracks, you know, helping around the decision-making process, right? And tracking more of a symbolic model, which is really along the lines of how, if you were to define a digital twin in the traditional context where people think of it really for IoT, um, but then you're pulling that definition of a digital twin more broadly saying um, there's decisions that are happening on a project, whether they be around sustainability, lead, transportation, building automation. And through that symbolic model, you're assisting, you know, building out ways using technology to help uh, make better decisions, right? So, so regardless of the the format where it sits, et cetera, you're just going to go in and do the dirty work to get whatever information you can, but to just use it, use those as inputs for what your real goal is, which, which is to make better decisions at the end of the day. Is there anything that you. Yeah. To to that? Thanks Lucas. Yeah. The, um, you know, I mean, in some ways, you know, talk, as you've mentioned about the history of the evolution of all of the tools and everything, it would be nice if we could sort of claim that we're getting, to the point where we can uh, uh, not just use the tools uh, directly, but also leverage them for for business decisions. So, uh, in our capital planning tool, you know, it, it's it's nice if we can learn from what we have uh, and and help, as Terry mentioned earlier on, you know, help help uh, define what is needed to help with the capital planning process in general, whether it's a single building or the whole campus, for. A, a TCO analysis or anything, but uh, uh, you know it, it. It does depend on uh, high quality data, so we want to be able to track, as Brian mentioned, you know the age of the data, the the relevance, as Ifanyi said, you know, you know they, they have to be upgraded and things. But we can automate a lot of that. Plus, you know, we 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 want to leverage the spatial data. Spatial data is still uh, um, a critical part of making these business decisions. So in, in tracks, even though we present the, the, the uh, visual roadmap, the capital planning roadmap, uh, we still pre-compute a lot of things out of the building information model. Uh, so we can create, uh, because we wanna be able to visually communicate to a variety of stakeholders who are not experts in all these tools. So we pre-compute shell models so that they can be loaded in the browser. Uh, we like to separate things in the floor so you don't have to ever load the entire building. You can just load a floor if that's, you know, the scale that is relevant for something. Uh, so there's, there's, um, there's a lot of parts to put together to be able to support the business level. But I think, at least <laughs> from our perspective, we're starting to get there. Great, great. Um, there's also, uh, it's interesting because through this conversation, we've, we've talked some about sort of handovers during mi at milestones, which is obvious and makes sense. But then there's a lot of discussion about what happens sort of in between the milestones, right? And, you know, while project is being delivered, we live in those two worlds, the, the contract and then the day-to-day -day decision making processes, which makes the project eventually what it is. And, you know, I heard comments around, you know, uh, uh, Brian, I think you mentioned using a design build as a mechanism for a checks and balance uh, against what was designed and what was installed. Um, and in any case, the digital delivery process inherently lends itself to quicker feedback loops and what we're normally uh, used to sort of with these handover uh, uh, milestone sort of uh, contracts. So are the, I guess the question is, are there opportunities and is there room for, you know, our major AECO players to exchange data on a more regular basis to obtain these greater insights and to break the status quo or is, are we still seeing that there's still some hesitation and we're just not quite there yet? I can share a little bit of an example. Um, we are uh, in design moving into construction documents on our, on our new hospital project. And that is directly adjacent to our Center for Advanced Care. Um, like they are 
on top of each other with utilities, crossing sites, and things like that. Two different contractors, two different design teams. Um, we have co-architects on the hospital, and we have Smith Group on the um, Center for Advanced Care. McCarthy is on the Center for Advanced Care, and and um, uh, Hensel Phelps is is building the hospital. And we had had to set up basically a live link between the two projects um, so that they all had access to the information from one another as it was sort of live, you know, as it was in real time, um, because things are changing so fast and the projects are going so fast, we can't, we can't wait to provide to the CAC team, we can't wait to provide to them the um, hospital information until a milestone, it just doesn't work. Um, so, you know, we have not only regular meetings, but but frequent exchanges of data and live models that that are, you know, being exchanged so that they're as up to date as we can be, because we just can't wait for those milestones. And I, and I think that's a great um, boon to an owner um, and to a process to be able to sort of in real time, whether it be in our case, shoulder to shoulder reviews or, or you know, sharing of information among several projects, um, you know, we, we just can't wait for those milestones anymore. Yeah, I, I agree, I'll chime in. Um, I, I, we are also moving quickly on our projects and I think um, what's, what's missing is that uh, a lot of decisions are being made um, there's a lot of data being still exchanged on email, and um, and I think some of that gets lost on the uh, neurology research building I mentioned at the beginning. Um, great project, very successful, but at the end there were questions as there typically are. You know, people thought they asked for things, and we have to go back and see if they actually did or not. And it was really hard to find that information. We actually had to go and hunt for emails in some cases which in my mind is very antiquated. We shouldn't have to do that. So I think we still have a ways to go on this, on how to keep um, data relevant just as, as, as progress data and, uh, and make it accessible um, and uh, just you know a, a nice repository that one could go to and, and pull it up at any time. We'll, we'll keep the con the contractual part of that for a separate session, <laughs> but but you know I think we're speaking in the spirit of collaboration and what you know what what would actually help and assist projects. So I think uh, th that's that's all good. Uh, if any, were you going to chime in here? Oh yeah, I was just going to add really quick that um, one thing that we have done uh, with some of our clients is to set up interim um, check-ins with them so that. Um, before milestones, they have the opportunity to take a look at the model and take a look at the data and see if it kind of matches up with a lot of what the expectations are. So they don't have to wait for milestone deliverables to be able to access that. Um, simply again, because of the fact that things move very quickly and you don't want to um, have information get lost. But what we've done is to have the clients uh, facilities maintenance group actually sit in in some of the coordination meetings um, and give input. And it's been really invaluable because sometimes they can take a look at um, a, damp uh, a damper and say, well, you know, where well, you've got the handle of that damper is not going to be accessible for me, you know, when I come in with a ladder or you know, the way you've got that chiller came in with a dolly to try and you know, take that out. I'm not going to have enough clearance room. And these are things that don't come up in typical class sessions and things like that. So um, we found that it's great to be able to get them to uh, commit early. Um, and we've just set up milestone dates to where, you know, interim dates where like, you know, they come in and take a look and see exactly what's going on and everyone's abreast of everything. Plus, we've got a lot of platforms now, you know, like BIM360, where they can just go and pull, in, you know, the, the models from, um, and they're just cloud-based. So all the data is always there and they just upload dates like every month or so. Okay, uh, it looks like we're, we're coming up on our last uh, 10 minutes here. So why don't we go ahead and go through our final question uh, and we'll, we'll go in reverse order uh, from the intros uh, before we get to Q&A. Um, so uh, Ozan, we'll start with you. And this is just any sort of uh, uh, leaving thoughts that you have on how you see digital assets evolving over the next five years, 
in terms of being used to deliver projects and operate facilities? I mean, just your your overall thoughts for for the upcoming five years or so in the future of digital assets. Uh, sure. Um, I mean, five years is a long time, so I hope we can achieve a lot. <laughs> um, uh, from our side, we we imagine a um, a bit of a, a triangle of. Uh, relating the total cost of ownership. Uh, there's an ANSI standard for this now uh, developed by the campus community, academic campus community. So we wanna implement the total cost of ownership as a roadmap in our system to help uh, campuses go through that process. Uh, so between uh, TCO, um, deep retrofits for sustainability. So be able to uh, think about these campus-wide capital projects that have been successful at uh, places like uh, UBC in Canada and Stanford uh, and others. Um, uh, we're working with USC on something like that now. Uh, and then the third part of the triangle I would say is the ecosystem of innovation. So like if we can really successfully um, have a, a high quality digital um, a repository of all of our assets, uh, then we should be able to, to leverage that and connect that with uh, an entire ecosystem of all of the suppliers and, and parts and automate, um, you know, recommendations at that level as well for continuous improvement. So, and I, I, I guess I could call it the continuous improvement triangle. I hope that would be uh, possible in a five year time frame. Yeah, I think you're gonna have to copyright that one. <laughs> um, no, great, uh, if any? Uh, yeah, on, I hope he doesn't copyright that because uh, I totally agree with everything he said. Um, but at, at the same time, I, I feel like for me, looking forward five years, I would really love to see um, the digital data become the deliverable at the end of the day. Um, I feel like a lot of times the digital data, the 3D model is shoehorned to kind of fit what is being delivered on paper or at least being delivered as PDFs. Um, and then there's this race to try and catch up the models to what is being sent out as the complete final drawings. Um, I feel like these two should be, you know, should kind of work concurrently and be updated in real time together. And I think that, you know, when these become deliverables in themselves, then you have everything that you need in one spot. Um, I would like to see us have a version of software that anyone can open and not be well i use bentley so i can't open an autodesk file or you know um i think we're getting there i think autodesk is fast becoming the one source but i i, I still feel like we have a little bit way to go to where we've got information that is across the board, anything that anyone else can open, regardless of what platform that you use. So yes, that's where I'm hoping to see us go uh, and get to down in the future where we're delivering models um, and not just PDFs and the models as an afterthought. Um, and I'd like to see us get to a point where anyone can access these models regardless of who they are, what platform they use. Uh, Laura, did you have any final thoughts on it? I'm just going to say, I think I've heard a couple of things tonight that intrigue me. So I love this idea of being able to extract the data that we need so that we don't have to worry so much about having the data, keeping the data, whose data is it, is it duplicated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that there's a concept that there's just this giant pool of data and that our extraction tools are the, are the things that are smart and that really help us get at what we need from this giant pool of data or lake. I've heard the term data lake. so. Maybe yeah. that's where I hope things go in five yeah. years. And maybe machine learning and AI is a potential opportunity to use that too. Great, uh, Brian? Yeah, I, I really echo what Laura, Fanyi, and Zom said. I, you know, I think universality and um, accessibility are, are key. You know, finding means to knit um, these disparate pieces together in a, a, a way that is um, really accessible and useful. Um, I would add, you know, I'm, I was intrigued by the milestone conversation. You know, I, I think, you know, we're seeing milestones as, and you mentioned the contractual uh, part of it, you know, milestones are really a contractual measure to, to measure progress and ensure progress and that kind of thing. And, and the data is much more fluid than that, I think in a good way. So I, I'm really intrigued by where we go in terms of the fluidity of the data and the the you know how the data gets delivered over time, 
not just at these milestones. Um, uh, I think someone asked a question of me, I think it was Lauren um, asked if I could give a specific example of something not, not modeled that we wish it had been. We use a lot of post tension slabs. Um, so uh, where the tendons are is uh, critical to renovations down the road. And there are times where we don't know where they are and we have to go out there and x-ray and, and figure it out where the as built, you know, you, you never quite can trust it, but um, you know, if the tendon broke in the field or something like that, you know, that's one example, so. Oh, great, great. Uh, uh, Terry, if, if you can sort of close out our discussion our discussion section and, and then uh, John B will jump in with some questions from the audience. Yeah, um, thank you. The, the innovation I would like to see, there, there's several and I agree. And, and the next five years or in five years from now, I hope that there's things we haven't even dreamt of. But um, right now in light of the pandemic um, and also as a cost saving measure, we are exploring doing virtual mock-ups um, on a large project. And even that is, is challenging. There, there's, there's still a cost to that. There's a time element to that. Um, we're using a lot more anim of animations versus uh, actually building models on our larger projects. Again, a, a high cost um, dollar item and the time that goes into it is, um, is significant. And then just to update those animations is, is a whole nother conversation. So I'm hoping that we make some progress on that because I think there's some great virtual tools out there that we're unable to maximize just because of the, of the, the cost and complexity. Thanks, Terry. Uh, John V, were you able to capture some questions from the yeah, audience? Yeah, so we have a couple, a few questions streaming in and we'll try to get through them. Uh, I think one of the questions was, is the future of digital twin of the actual campus set up in a way that can grow and evolve with layers of data and, you know, where do, where do you see that as far as do you see architects actually working on your in a perfect world that we could all work on the same model and live um, and not thinking about contracts and all of those other things, but is that where, where we are headed in the next five years kind of uh, hopefully uh, if you can, one of you could elaborate and see what your perspective is on that. <laughs> Azam seems like you right uh, jumping yeah, sure. there. I could, I, could, um, I could say that, you know, I mean, uh, from the computer science side, we imagine that uh, the, the softwareization of everything. So, uh, you know, if we can transition as an industry to a more database driven uh, uh, ecosystem, then you would have a Git like repository where you do check ins and check outs of data and merge data sets and so on. So, everything becomes a little more um, uh, uniform and accessible uh, and automatable processes. So then uh, you could create a, um, uh, um, a, I think Laura said, a smart extraction tool that would just surface the part of the big model that you're, you're interested in and that's relevant to you and then make modifications and that'll get put back into the model in the proper way. So um, hopefully that something like that can can become possible. We're working with Speckle Systems as well uh, that has started a, a little bit of, of that work. So uh, that's pretty exciting for us as well. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, as one of the questions we have is, how are owners incorporating post-occupancy evaluation data to measure performance versus design intent? And does it influence later decisions? So maybe Terry or Brian can take this one. Sure. Yeah, we, uh, we actually... Um implemented two surveys recently. So one survey goes out to the end users at the end of design, and we have another survey that's much more complex that goes out uh, at 10 months after occupancy um, to see how, how we performed. In addition to that, um, we have a meeting, kind of a one-on-one -on -one to talk about lessons learned and just do an overall debrief on the project. So this is relatively new, but it's, um, it's being um, you know, well-regarded, and I think we're getting some good feedback and finding out ways we can continue to improve. Well, thank you. And I think we're almost closing down. So I'll try to get the last one in that just came in. Um, so, sorry. Um, some software vendors state that, that their BIM formats are not suitable for archival purposes. Their limits are suitable for native BIM file formats as repositories of information. Is that a concern or has your organization kind of address this. I know you've all mentioned that you've got disparate tools and you know, 
how you've been trying to integrate that? So. Um, yeah, I, I think these last two questions are so spot on. You know, as Terry outlined earlier, you know, and, and Laura about uh, the usefulness of the data to make decisions. And um, if we go and, and don't measure the performance versus the design intent, um, you know, we are bound to make the same mistakes over again. Um, and, and so, you know, I think this relates to the, the next question about the durability of the information. Um, you know, if we go back in in years time and the, and the model is inaccessible because like Afani was talking about, we just can't get it upgraded to the next level up or, or I mean, the next version up or, or it's corrupted or something like that. So it is a concern. Um, I, I, I would bet that Azam has a lot more um, knowledge than I about about the durability of the models, but it ab absolutely is a concern. You know, we are loaded with information, whether it be emails or Word documents or or you know an Excel spreadsheet on up to a, a BIM file, and we find you know we go to open it and we find it's inaccessible. Um, so it's it's absolutely a concern of ours. I'll just add that yeah, uh, the combination of both, uh, you know, uh, a system for uh, uh, versioning data together with uh, automated model checking would be a, an important part, as Brian mentions, of data durability, especially over the long term. And I, I, whether it's archival or not is a, is a separate issue, but uh, um, a related issue, of course. Um, the problem with a, a truly archival format, like a version of IFC or something, is that um, it might not capture all of the things that you want to represent. Of course, you can extend it with custom things, but then it becomes a slightly custom thing. So it's a, it's always a balance. Well, thank you. All right. I think I think we're up on time here. Um, you know, the, just based on the discussion and, and also the questions, it seems like there could be several sub sessions of this this topic. But uh, in any case, uh, we really appreciate the panelists uh, uh, for going through. Uh, and, and, and both just representing yourselves, your organizations and, and going through some, some of the discussion that we had. Uh, also appreciate the AIA Los Angeles chapter and the practice committee for hosting and appreciate all of the, uh, uh, the audience coming and attending and spending your time with us here this evening. So if, unless there's anything else, uh, Will or John B uh, that you wanted to close out on, I think we can go ahead and wrap it up. No, we thank you all for your time. And uh, I know there are a few questions that came in, but uh, we'll try to address them. If people feel need, we might forward them to you. <laughs> but we appreciate that. Thank you.